This week, we welcome to the show witch, author, biochemist, oriental medicine specialist, and uh, teacher and trainer, Marja Doust. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Delighted to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to this one. It was a a series of uh, synchronicitous events that uh, led to this conversation happening exactly now when uh, when it needs to. Oh, I love it when things unfold in that perfect way. It's so Absolutely. good. Absolutely. And one of the things, and I'm going to modify the traditional first question because I think this is an area of overlap between the two of us. And I think you'll pick up what I'm about to say in the question. Uh, Maja, were you a sick kid? I was very sick when I was a kid. Correctamundo. Yes. Because I've heard you talk about, well, let me do it this way. So tell us the story of how uh, childhood illness turned you into, it contributed to who you became. Yes, happy to. Uh, I had very bad asthma growing up. I grew up in Canada, in Montreal, so it was very cold and a lot of snow in the winter. So if you have asthma, really hard for your lungs uh, in the winters there. So I would just be home all the time in bed, sick. I remember sometimes I would spend months home from school. Um, but when I was young, young, like two years old, I had really bad pneumonia. And I remember, I have a weird memory, but I remember vividly my mom was in my bed with me because I was so sick. And I had an out-of-body experience, and I went and I could see myself and my mom in the bed, but it was like from above. And when I woke up in the morning, I asked my mom if we had an attic, because somehow I thought I had like gone up to the attic and was looking at us. And I was like, yeah, I saw us from the attic. And she's like, what are you talking about? Um, and then I had like a series of events where I would kind of, you know, go out of my body when I was super sick. And I would see a lot of strange things and experience a lot of odd things. So I feel like that really impacted my view of reality because I couldn't. It, I knew that what I was seeing was not the same as what most people were saying was reality. So I would kind of go internal um, more and just watch stuff. Yeah. So I would, mine wasn't asthma, but I used to get very sick as well. And it would be like sleep paralysis stuff. So sleep paralysis, oh. heart attacks, but similar, like leaving the body or seeing things in the room. And, and there's something about, cause <sighs> It, over the decades, it becomes fashionable to say that, like, um, trauma is required, not required is the wrong word, but uh, sort of required to end up in some kind of shamanic capacity. And we go, it's it's kind of like artists. It goes in and out of fashion to say you have to have had pain to be an artist. And I think we're coming back into the idea that, like, no, there's, there's something to it. Because how you just described it, how you finished that sentence of, like, I knew reality as everyone else experienced it, kind of wasn't the only thing that was on offer. I, I saw a ghost of someone get his, uh, die from like a, and it was a loop, right? Like a, a coconut hitting his head, like Henry Sugar's type stuff. Wow. In Fiji when I was really, really sick, uh, one time in, in the island. And I'm, and I'm like, so things are looped in place. All this stuff that I knew as a kid, just cause I was, so it's like having psychedelics with a really awful body high, right? Like <laughs> That is probably the best description of it I've ever heard because similar experiences I've had were on like vision quests, right? So that would match it. And to me, it's very similar to what you said where there's these like overlaps or time loops that you witness and especially in areas, but I've also experienced them where... I feel like all astral travel to the area and see the history or event uh, happen. I don't know if that's happened to you as well, uh, but it is. It's like this overlay uh, yeah. that repeats. Yes. And using the word overlay, another. This is actually the same evening where I saw like the the looped ghost situation. There, I I actually got out of bed because I thought I could see demonic coconuts dancing ring a ring a rosy <laughs> like on the couch in in the hotel room and i'm like and i knew as a kid i'm like i'm not seeing that so like i need to get up and go and look at the cat and i was like this well for people who are listening to it i was about a foot and a half away from the couch and i could see them and they were animations kind of like um 
not well, almost like DMT. Like it was animated. Like I could tell that they weren't actually animated demonic coconuts playing Ring a Ring a Rosie on the couch. But I knew something was there. It's just I even though I didn't have words because I was like ten of screen memories. I'm like my mind is somehow doing a thing. Like there's something there, and my child mind, while sick, is seeing it as a ring a ring a rosy of like animated demon coconuts. It's very interesting. There was definitely cartoon stuff that I got as well. A lot of cartoony uh, things. What my? It's funny. Mine was with this three little pigs um, <laughs> thing that I saw the cartoony thing as a child. But that's funny. You had the coconuts. I guess it's because yeah. you were in Fiji. Um, yeah, that's, uh, definitely. So yeah. my. Earlier on when I would have sleep paralysis events that I now kind of think are some sort of experience uh, stuff because I would be imagining um, the uh, Romulan Diderodex class warbird, if you're that much of a nerd, uh, and and uh, and then I would be having these interactions. There's a He-Man figurine called Buzz-Off, which was... Um, the bee or yeah, the fly, yeah. the fly so, guy, yeah. Yeah, the bee guy, right? Oh, yeah, I think it was a bee. Anyway, like... So when I look at it, having grown up and become an adult and learned more about UFO experiences, I'm like, all right, so I had a spaceship and I had an insectoid as as a child could understand them. And I'm like, all right, there's something, yeah, there's something going on there. <laughs> yeah. The insect guys are really real. Uh, with my Native American teacher, when we would do uh, events, I saw the praying mantis guys uh, yeah, okay. were yeah, like yeah. really prominent uh and the main ones that I experienced, yeah. Well, so that's this is. I thought I'm glad we started here with where you were sick a kid because I think there there is something to it. I've certainly, over, as the years have developed, particularly after my shamanic training, kind of owned like, yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what that was. And to be honest, it's the, the the traditional weird kid question was to surface that in people because I had the idea that if you end up on a podcast about magic. It might not have been because you've had, hopefully you've had better than we did, like uh, better than having a, a childhood illness. Yes. But uh, you've probably had something uh, go on. And no, every that... shaman that I've met uh, has yeah. the same story. I met uh, my friend Jude from, he's an African indigenous shaman and he was terribly ill his whole childhood, you know, uh, similarly, my teacher, Kelvin DeWolf, very sick, terrible asthma too. Uh, his mom did a healing on him that he said he saw a black cloud of smoke come out of his body, like, uh, you know, as if he got an exorcism, literally, but that every single powerful healer that I've ever known had near-death experiences, uh, which I did also later, but then they've like died or almost died or was like really sick. So I feel like part of that experience is, uh, it certainly helps make time really weird, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. Because you go out of the rest of the flow of life. Like for you too, when you are ill, you can't like play with the other kids and you're yeah. isolated. So it's a little bit like, you're in a forced hermitage, so you exit that kind of social scheduling. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's uh, the other thing that I think works for it is now as an adult, if I, which happens rarely because I, I live a much healthier life, because I was just explaining it's early spring in southern Tasmania on a permaculture farm. There's, it's, I, I don't get, thank the gods, I don't get as sick down here, right? Um, but when I am unwell, and you sort of, you know, you're like, oh, I've got a fever. I'm going to go sleep it off. Take some water, head to bed and 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 sleep it off. There's a moment because you obviously everyone's familiar with illness dreams, which is like there's something going on in my inner landscape related to uh, how I'm experiencing that in the body. And there's a moment, it's different each time, but there's a moment in in my illness dreams where a resolution occurs and I wake up and I can still be a little bit symptomatic, but I know I've like, quote unquote, the fever's broken. Like I've come out of it going like the unlock for my um th that particular health journey has happened in the inner landscape and you mm. kind of mentioned at the beginning when i uh, am guiding people through meditations or what have you and and getting them to bring their attention to that inner landscape i'll say something like which uh most of the world um for all time considers more real than our uh, external experience and that's a lovely thing to say but if like but it's true <laughs> and it and it's a truth that i got as a kid it's like no it's it's a different kind of real, but it is more real. And I, I that's one of the gifts I take from my illness experience as a kid is 
like, mm, something's going on in there. <laughs> you become <laughs> more sensitive, yeah, right? Yeah. To f- because part of it is you go into that internal place, obviously, because uh, I always joke, like with clients and stuff, you really don't think about your organs or your body until it's messed up, right? And <laughs> you can feel it. But otherwise, we don't feel our insides, right? When do you, unless you like eat too much or you have discomfort is when we feel inside. So when you're ill a lot as a child, you have that advantage of gaining a sensitivity to that feeling. And then your consciousness or subconsciousness with the dreams, the fever dreams are real. And so those will usually give you clues to emotional uh, aspects of what has caused uh, your discomfort or illness, right? And whether it's like somebody made fun of you or like you got that pit in your stomach because something didn't feel good or stuff like that. When you just really develop an ability to feel into it. And then unfortunately, as the case may be, you can feel into others too. So you get more, I don't, did that happen to you even as a kid where you felt like you could feel other people when they were having an issue um i so i have a friend down here um avalon cameron she's a brazilian card reader and we're both scorpio rising and so uh-huh. we talk about having like scorpio rising powers which is that i don't have i never had the empath like overwhelm about being around people who are upset upset but i know exactly <laughs> what's going on but it's almost like a more cynical like i know what you're lying about um yeah so I have that, but I, I never got the, um, which I, a bunch of my friends have had like the, 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 the challenges with energetic boundaries, uh, when it comes to other people's feelings, I've always been pretty, um, pretty good with that. Um, yeah. I, instead I have like, a, I know when you're lying <laughs> or, yeah. and I tell people you can fake it. Like you can pretend to be Scorpio rising by just assuming the worst about everyone. <laughs> <laughs> one time it's listen, true you can see shadow right yeah, see people's yeah. shadow yeah, yeah. behavior yeah it, it, like 55 percent of the time people are not being honest with themselves which means that the real action is going on in the subtext anyway so you can just step into like you, you can have you can wear scorpio rising if you want by just assuming that everyone is like low-key lying to themselves <laughs> all the time. And you it's really and you severe yeah, yeah, yeah. The shadow yeah. behavior is so prevalent and so affecting people's ability to engage reality. Like, I mean, Kelvin is a full Scorpio with like, he's very Scorpio. And he, there's this one instance where we were talking to this gal and she was telling us she was having these heart problems and this heart surgery. And he was just looking at her, like looking at her, he goes, and he just goes, cocaine. And yeah. she was like, what? And he goes, cocaine you yeah. had to have heart surgery because of cocaine and she was like well i did cocaine but like that wasn't it and he was like yeah that yeah, was, was it yeah, yeah. but like he could see exactly but people don't want to think anything is their fault or that they are a bad person so they're going to kind of like just go pirate style and pretend they can't see yeah, it exactly. you know yeah, yeah that's my yeah that's my particular in, in client work like that's the work of the west like jaguar stuff is i i know when people are like when their negative self-talk is too strong and that's causing it like i i see all the the scorpio rising stuff like that <laughs> yeah that's yeah. my um yeah that's my little little technique so let's go from because we want to talk about time magic and the Jing. Yes. So let's go from childhood illness, childhood strange experiences, and and take the story to broadly speaking magic, and almost like because you studied a bunch of different things that I understand to be definitely related in like a, a journey for understanding truth and how the cosmos works. Like if you if you actually look at your field of studies, it's like actually that makes complete sense. <laughs> that makes complete sense. They go me. together. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the way it happened. But did you did you find there's a leading question, but you'll go with it. Did you find like magic first or did you find the I Ching TCM style stuff first? Like which one led you to which? Definitely magic first. Uh and as a teenager, I was growing up on an island and my home life was like not very comfortable. So I'd hang out in the woods most of the time. So 
I would just take my Walkman and my Metallica tapes and go hang out in the forest. And so I would see again and experience stuff that kind of matched more my experiences when I was sick as a kid. So that felt more comfortable to me. So I started reading and getting all into paganism and Wicca and magic, uh, like pretty straightforward, like I guess you would call European magic, right, was my intro. And then as I went into more scientific studies, because I wanted to understand like material and stuff and like reality and plants, my mom always had a giant garden. So I was like obsessed with plants and trying to figure out plants. And then when I learned like more about alchemy after studying science, I got all into all the alchemists and started reading Jung. And then that led me to the I Ching and I was doing martial arts. So then I went to Chinese medicine. Right. So it kind of had like yeah, a yeah. progression. Yeah. Cool. So one of the things that I, it's interesting, everyone starts in, in some kind of, you know, the well in book neo-paganism, uh, it's kind of what it's for. And it's interesting because one of the things I see across your books, which I've always really admired, is um, is holding the line for like the reality of, well, um, spirits, right? Holding the line for the reality of, no, these are, um, it, you're not, it's a little Jedi mind trick. Like the, the, um, the rosemary is and has a spirit. So does the oak. And, and, and for these beings to be, uh, having their own full agency and nevertheless in relation to you, which doesn't land very well in neo-paganism. It is kind of like underneath it. I think people who spend a lot of time in neo-paganism drop down to that earlier, uh, like archetypally earlier, like a Gebsa style earlier layer <laughs> of consciousness. Uh, and I think they can find, they can operate satisfactorily uh, in it there. But once you are at that lower layer where well, let's just call it spirit, right? Then the interoperability or the, the invitation to interoperability between TCM and Ayurveda and European folklore and so on opens up in a way that isn't much of a clash. Like it just makes sense. Like, do you know what I mean? Does that Was that your experience of it? It really was. And as you study like the creation myths across cultures too, they all line up speaking of these spirits and these stories and things. And yeah, I totally agree with you with that pagan, aver the neo-pagan aversion to it. I have felt a lot of like, there's still like this fear of demons. I feel like it yeah, might yeah. be like infiltration of Christianity or something like that, where they feel like, Ooh, it's bad. Or they don't um, really want to acknowledge the presence of these sentiences or Maybe haven't had an experience of them too. Who knows? But it's, once it's, you really both, feel, you can, yeah, like yeah. if you're stuck in that framework, uh, ceremonially speaking or ritualistically speaking, you're not going to get much in the way of contact. My yeah. my understanding of it is funny enough. Speaking of Jung, uh, it's it's impeding like complete individuation because I perceive this is the Scorpio rising stuff. I perceive the fear of being too out, too outside of the mainstream, right? Like so, Wicca as explained in a, you know, Llewellyn book sense. As a Llewellyn author, I can say it without upsetting people, I hope. Um, yes. Wicca gives you, um, like, the crust cut off your sandwich. Like, you can still be normal. <laughs> you can still be like, well, it's like, all the gods are the one god anyway, blah, blah, blah. Like, you can just talk to water spirits while, or think about water elementals while washing the dishes. And I'm like, mm. Like I said, it's a, everyone starts there, but I, I perceive people's um, refusal or um, concern about going further than that is to do with like uh, fear of rejection, fear of being too weird for a family. Very much. Yeah. I agree. It's like that non, it's very non-threatening, yes. right? Where you're like the nice one that it will help someone with a love spell or something. Yeah, um, yeah that's not the kind of magic I do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a lot more confrontational and looking at entities and all of this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So it's not very friendly for people that have comfort levels, you know, outside of where they want to put me. So if I kind of breach those boundaries and start bringing up things that pushes them past there, they jam like that's the end of that conversation for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think um, I call it like they're trying to be half pregnant. Um, and, and you can, 
you, you it's it's actually when I if I steal man it it's a very good uh, initiatory doorway because it will uh, keep people who aren't together enough perhaps or intact enough to use my team practical's word to go further along with the work it'll keep them yes. at the doorway uh, but for I people agree. who are like oh I, something oh wow this kind of stuff is real I, but also it's not here <laughs> I need to move further in or further under I think uh, if I steal man it you go all right that works. It's true. It's kind of like, are you going to listen to pop metal or are you going all the way to death metal? You, you know go. what I mean? There so it's like, whatever. People have different levels. As a Sagittarius, I feel like I'm going to go exploring a little yeah. further past maybe where I should, uh, questing, admittedly, questing, but like I'm yeah. going to go on the quest. Yes. Sweet. So speaking of that, uh, you've, uh, if I pick that up that correctly, you found the I Ching first. So I want to talk about time magic. And when we were emailing backwards and forwards, I'm glad that we want to take it into a conversation where we can talk about the I Ching, but also, uh, how to say this right, a shamanic framework of time. So there's, there's like Please. layered experiences. So where do you want to go with that? Do you want to talk about like time magic and metaphysics of time first and then go to I Ching? Or do you want to do I Ching and then that? It's a it's a good question. We could talk about maybe the metaphysics first. Uh, I I view all divination is a form of time magic, right? Because absolutely, and I do astrology all day long too. So I feel like all day I go back and forth through time with people, <laughs> like doing the charts and seeing like, well, this was that then, and then this is where it's going. And so I'm always fast forwarding and rewinding in time through divination sessions. So. Uh, but then when you go and do the shamanic work, you see time so differently, you know, that even, I mean, to me, after I got to that metaphysical time magic, the divination seems uh, kind of pointless, right? Or like, yes, um, I see what you mean. Yeah. it kind of, you yeah. know, obviously I still use it because it's a tool and it's very good for assisting people to have an experience directly, very quickly of something crazy and synchronistic but like once you do certain things as you know even like we were talking about with seeing the layers and dimensions you're like we are not in kansas anymore and that all just kind of goes like wow this isn't even close to what you can really experience yeah so i did my um Four Winds certification online whilst we weren't allowed to leave the country for those two fucking awful years. Oh, and, yeah. Because uh, I decided, like, if I can't get to the Andes, the Andes have to come to me. That was my that was my joke about it. Uh, and Alberto in the training will say, like... Some oh, pretty... Alberto Viodo? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, st I studied with him at the University of Philosophical Research. I took That's his class. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, um, he says some pretty out there things that if I hadn't been in like a full uh, ayahuasca dieta in the Amazon like the year before, seeing people, to, seeing the shaman turn into a jaguar and stuff, he'll say things like shamans work outside of time. And and if you're coming at that cold, you're like, well, what, is, what is going on here, my 90s Hay House author friend? Like, what, what's happening? <laughs> They're like, they do. <laughs> they do. And, the, and that's um, the, 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 we have that if you, Unfocus your eyes and look across Vedic astrology and Helleno modern astrology, uh, and obviously Chinese, but I don't know it as well. That uh, we, we, a couple of years ago we did some work with the Lunar Mansions amongst the membership, and one of the um, one of the spirits showed me, well, one of the angels showed me that because I was trying to understand like why does sidereal and tropical work for something as Yep. Um, specifically relational as where the moon is in the sky, right? And these angels showed me, it was almost like, um, you know how if you have a pencil or pins or something vertically beside a glass of water, it'll look vertical until it hits the water and then it'll like diagonally <laughs> skew. And they're saying it, it's, it's, a, um, it's an invitation to relation. Like so, um, so tropical is an invitation to relation that they will respond to because it's like a collection of agreements in and outside of time. And mm -hmm. so it's weird after I've done like the, the shamanic approach, I'll get responses like that in ceremony and it won't sound crazy to me <laughs> anymore. It doesn't but... sound crazy to me either. <laughs> it, literally what I figured out or saw much like yourself is that any system will work if you make a system that follows certain laws, right? So because we live in 
nature, which follows phi or the golden ratio, right? If you make any system under that, you can still extract data from it because everything is fractals, right? So while we're in this, we literally can't make something that isn't in the law, <laughs> which sounds weird. But so if you have these different systems, because I was struggling for so long, like, why can I use Western astrology? And wouldn't that make Vedic astrology wrong or the other one wrong, right? Or like yeah. illegitimate. But then I would get information that was accurate from all of the systems. So it's really something that'll bake your noodle. Yeah. But I agree with the angels that gave you that information because it's just how you're extracting the data. Yeah. By the time this video comes out or this podcast comes out, I will have released, released the intro video for the Time Magic course. And I use the metaphor of sport which is um, what's a bigger idea, netball or sport, right? So because mm. um, netball and cricket and rugby uh, all work according to a collection of rules that aren't really written down anywhere, mm -hmm. which is like this idea of sport. So above, and because it's funny, like Vedic and uh, Hellenistic, I don't really have a problem putting them together. It's like, because everyone will I, like Vedic tropical house system. And I'm like, wait, 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 I do Mayan astrology. You want to talk about how you get both <laughs> into work and work? Like you yeah. have to jump. And that's, that's like netball and cricket, right? And they both yes. work. So what are the collection of agreements that allow these um, systems, which are given as gifts by Sky Country, by like the Hanukkah? Yes. Archer? What are the collection of agreements that we can operate on? And and uh, the, the metaphor I'm using in this particular video is what's the bigger idea, netball or sport? Because if you're trying yeah. to get like netball and cricket to work together, it's not, it, it, it won't. But if you go up and go, all right, well, so what is it? It's, um, it's the decision, the consensual, uh, well, it's a consent decision to uh, to play a game where there are certain rules that we will all act as if are true for the yes. duration of this. Like, there, like you think, oh, hang on, consensus, is... consensus. Yes, exactly. It's really when an agreement is consensus, which is consciousnesses that are coming into unification, right? Yes. So, and that's it's really like what's the law that has the largest unifier, right? That's what I became interested in as Kelvin. Uh, would say, like, what paradigm or group, set of laws are you going to choose? And he would advocate, like, for the sky, the heavens, and Manitou, you choose the one that is the most unifying, that yes. has the most yeah. uh, coverage, right? That's that divine masculine will, wants everything to unify. So it has that whenever we come together in groups and have our consciousness come to consensus, this makes them very happy they like that yeah yeah yeah. which is like it's a it's animism differently described right so when i say that the cosmos is a community of beings that are in relation relation mm. is right relation is consensual relation so when we talk about consent and agreements and relating we're just using puny human english words for right. um for this state and and what happens when you bring that awareness to uh seeming challenges or incongruities with let's say systems of time magic they they dissolve because you you jump up to the level at which so i, I um i have like a chaos magic angle on it which is like find the level at which it's true or find a way to make it true because you look yeah. at it and you know like i did too it's like well my astrology works and so does hellenistic astrology so find a way <laughs> like where at what level of reality are they both true Right. Exactly. Agree. And it's when you do time magic, it's the same thing where you want to try to go up to the level where the most is true. So yeah. you can do varying degrees of time magic where say you just want to use our zodiac, right? Our zodiac. And that's your time magic thing. So it's it's good. And that's like galactic. Right. But it's not universal. Like like a lot of the shamans are working with, if you want to go outside of time, you have to go way, way, way back into primordial, right? And as you go further back into that primordial source origin, those kind of time structures uh, just, they're funny. They just evaporate. You're like Tuesday, yep. right? You're like, yep. To, like what is this what is this and it just becomes like a joke right the further 
back you go to the places where the most is true in terms of time, it it really is hard to integrate though when you have to then start dealing with people or schedules or things like that. But see, that's really because his I have a hot take on um, why or how the I Ching would sit in a magician's um, toolkit of time magic. Mm -hmm. And it's that it is what you were just saying there, because it is effectively, and it's both the oldest and to some extent the newest, like, but it's, I mean, in Australia, it's called snakes and ladders. I don't know what it is in Canada. Did you call it? Oh, that's and good. Yeah. Snakes and ladders is that's the ancient game. Yeah. So the I Ching end runs you through all of those different systems of magic between you and the source, because it is a way of deriving insight from time and change without having to onboard um, whole systems of astrology and interpretation. Like it's, yes. it's a, it's a, it's really, really interesting. So it's, it's at the one hand, the simplest of, of them. because It is. Any, I agree. But it's also because it's the oldest, it's like, oh, do I just want to hit like that? I'm using Gebser again, like that ever present origin, like bam, then the I Ching will get you that. And the oh, yeah. answer will be so eerie because it's traveled through like different uh, emanatory complexifying dimensions to get down to you. And it's so perfect. Its answer is so creepily and eerily perfect, especially as you haven't had to match your mind's interpretation to, oh, that's because Saturn is in Pisces right now. No, nope, you don't need uh, any of Venus, that. Which means it's this, all the, 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 those sort of five you know how in mathematics tests you are asked to show working? Mm -hmm. The I Ching doesn't yeah. show working. It just gives you the answer at the bottom. And it's, and it's correct. exactly correct. Yes. And you're like, what the, how did you do that? <laughs> I love, I've shown, like, I'll do I Ching readings for so many people. And there was this one, he was a lawyer. Okay. So he was like a square. You couldn't get more, no experience of magic, non believer, right? Atheist. And so we do the session and it was so precise and specific in that moment of time that he, I watched him have an, an existential crisis in front of me because it was so eerie. And, and he was like looking, he's like, how did you just read that in a book? Like, he was like, what is this book? Like to him, it didn't make any sense. He was like, let me read that. And he had to take the book and he was like, what is this book? Like he didn't believe that there was a paragraph that was so just for him just in that moment that could have been in this book and he there was no way he could grok it like he couldn't fathom that timelessness but also severe pertinence of it and uh like it's that. just really fun to I like do that, the pertinence of it yeah that's yeah. yeah so all right let's talk about the I Ching then how did you was it did you have an experience like that when you first encountered it because I got like I grew up in didn't grow up in Sydney I went to university in Sydney but I grew up nearby and Sydney's really Chinese like oh and, yeah um like 40 percent 35 percent now Chinese so half of my friends particularly at university were Chinese we went to university in Chinatown like from when I was doing magic I I don't remember the first time I encountered the I Ching and thought, wow, this is a really good system because like I had Chinese friends whose parents would own stores and they would consult the I Ching just like, like as a normal, they took it seriously and, and yeah. they weren't frivolous or flippant about it. But like um, Dana would come to university and be like, yeah, my parents checked the I Ching about the trip and uh, I can come. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Right? And And so I have this like, I don't, I, I always knew it was really, really good. And it actually, to be, to be honest, took me, I don't know, into my thirties before um, I started playing with it and going like, ah, uh, and it was, maybe it was even Terrence McKenna, but like it was when yeah. I decided that I needed more, a, a, a more robust understanding of time as process than I could get elsewhere. And that's where my journey began. But it was, cause my, that was literally my thought. It's like, oh, I need to understand time. Like I don't have a good metaphysics of process. Yeah. And my first thought was the I Ching because of my experience at university. So I had mm. this, like, I don't know, I didn't get a reading like your lawyer client of like, oh my God, this is so amazing. I should start doing this. But do you remember how you came to it? I really do. And I, I remember even the reading that I got, it was uh, hexagram 54.4 Four. changing into 19. And it's one that has repeated a lot. Uh, it's kind of like my 
prime hexagram reading that everything will continue to reduce uh, into. And it was so exactly freaky deaky for me and so specific. And it was literally describing what was happening to me in that time. So for from there, I was like, what? But I found it. I was a library nerd, so I would just go into the libraries and look in the metaphysical sections, right? Which is really what I think is um, a crime for people now because of algorithms that a lot of people are missing a lot of that experience of being able to just browse through things because the algorithm will go in directions that aren't yeah. the same as magical synchronicity all the time, you know? I don't know, maybe some people have synchronistic experiences with the algorithms, but I feel there are limitations. Like I can literally feel when I'm in an algorithm and I don't like it because I feel like there's more openness and space out of it. And I feel like the libraries really were able to do that for me because I could go and I could see the thing and I would be guided to go to where I was supposed to go. I guess uh, it would be the same in tech, but I just like it better. So yeah, I had I found, it's, yeah, that's yeah. Library. So, it's um, different, right? They have like a special magic that's all and, their and own. Part of it is like um, James Altucher used to call it idea sex. So you'll be mm. like, looking along titles and kind of have an awareness of what that book's about. And they start interacting in your head when you find the title you're after, but they're kind of doing this background processing that you're mm. experiencing visually when you can be around like books that are in the same approximate category. You, Absolutely. You get you you don't like you don't accidentally read them, but you get a different kind of smarter just by having them relating through your mind, which the yeah, like recommendation engines and so on. Uh, and I'm actually quite grateful. Willem I picked a few decent books sure. out of recommendation engines, but there's no substitute for standing in front of a wall of weird books. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um so that's how I found it. Uh and similarly I I learned with Dr. Stephen Karcher, who did the book Totally Ching, which I still, he was one of the first ones to do the Taoist uh, presentation in that kind of more shamanic way. And he tells a story that he was walking down the street in Montreal. I think it was a ballerina at the time or like a dancer, like a serious dancer. And he was walking by a bookstore and his whole being was drawn there was this red book on the shelf and he had had a dream the night before of a red book on the shelf. So it was totally like eaching dream invaded him and, you know, called him to it. But it's like that you just see it there and you have to know what is this? Like there's some books that are like that where you'll be, you know, just looking at stuff and then you're like, whoa, <laughs> what's that? I need that one. You know what I mean? So eaching was very much like that for me. I was thinking as I was putting the questions together for this show, that the Yijing is kind of, let me explain this because it's going to sound crazy, but like it's the good guy's Necronomicon. <laughs> because um, it's one of the oldest yes. books in the world. People don't realize that it's like out of anywhere on the planet, like it's the, the first written text we estimate to be 3,000 years old, right? Yeah. And there are... They found oracle bones that were older, oh, 6,000, like, well, 6,000 oh, years it old. It's plainly an interface between uh, Neolithic and Paleolithic modes yes. of being. And the written 100%. Word, like that's what it, so the Yijing is tens of thousands of years old, but the book, the Book of Changes, is 3,000 years old and is in ancient Chinese. And since then, people have, in, in the best possible way, grappled with and not known quite what to make of it so that you get layers of commentary and different books and different processes mm -hmm. and different mm -hmm. languages. So it's it's the archetypal hyperdimensional object book, right? And in that yes. sense, it's the good guy's Necronomicon because it's um, – and I know, you, like, I'm, I just, I think I like the ceremony of the coins. I know you're like, listen, the app, and it does, like, you, the app will work, <laughs> fine. I like to throw the coins and pretend. I like the balls. coins, too. <laughs> yeah. But the thing I is, have these cool coins. I just have to show you. My friend got them for me in China on her trip. They're, like, gigantic. Oh, they're these, fun. and they're, they're brass. So they God, make a lot, fun. they make really good sounds when you throw them. And so... It's just really oh, a, awesome. a sensory experience. I really like it. Mine are, uh, I use uh, three 20 centime 
Peruvian currency coins that I got as change from the witch's market in Lima. Ooh, uh, wow. Uh, so my, like, my coin rules, because, you know, that it's, whilst this is true that you can use whatever coins you have to hand, I think if you're not a numismaniac like I am, like, I'll, I'll keep magical coins from that process. Like, I bought a book of St. Cyprian and she gave me this change, and I'm like, I don't <gasps> keep this change. It's Ooh, that's good. I like that. And so those are my Ijin coins, but I think if people don't have magical coin they haven't hoarded coins like that then you should get the chinese ones which you can get no yours are awesome but like you could get like just off ebay or what have you yeah but i think when everyone says you can just use three quarters like you can but how it's not as sexy them, you know if you want to do that get three quarters in your birth year like make mm. it just add, add a little put a little stank on it as my yes. drag friend <laughs> and, like, and for me those are the rules it's like if you don't have magical coins like from a witch's market then get what the, are you doing really with and, your and life and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like the book itself is now an app that still works so it still is, works i find a book yes that began with like burning turtle shells is now an app and it's still the same book like that's fucking crazy it and still reads kind of, yes yeah. and it still works like the yeah. mechanism still works and i wanted to your necronomicon assessment is so good because on a couple of levels ancestor stuff is heavy in the I Ching, yeah. right? So like it is like a book of ghosts, uh, but also it's ghosts, it's like living ghosts. So, and to deal with the time magic thing, the idea of the I Ching is that it is from so long ago, way before you were born and will be way after you die. So you're looking at this thing that is immortal and uh, you're engaging with the spirit of the I Ching, which even though it's a book, the I Ching is totally a dragon, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like a dragon seraphim thing that has an attitude and a, a, it has such an attitude and a presence to it that when you engage, you can recognize immediately, a, a, even not the same as runes or tarot or anything. Yeah. It has this very... Uh, uh, recognizable presence and it's an immortal presence and when you start playing with it uh, if you can like kind of zoom out and dissociate I do a lot of dissociation which I think is one of the gifts of being sick right is that you can sort of yeah, dissociate and you can <laughs> see things from different angles so I would do like some readings and I was like oh my god like <laughs> This, I could do an I Ching reading, like literally till the day I die, and it'll still be with me along that time. But then, even I could, then you start thinking, maybe I could ask about it after my death or before my birth. So you start kind of, it really raises your awareness yeah, yeah, to yeah. this larger uh, scope of time. I think if you do it a lot, because or anyway, it did to me, because you start going, and even when you engage with other people, you're like, whoa. This is like humanity level, archetypal level of this timelessness that you can engage. And when you start to ask questions about time itself or some of these immortal features, I know everyone, you know, of course, is going to ask about like their boyfriend or their job or whatever. But try asking I Ching about some of these more uh, shamanic languages, and it still delivers. It still has yeah, yeah. those answers. Yes. Uh, the the spirits and the ancestors part of it. So I have the members, um, to if they're coming at a cold, they might have their own I Ching practice. But if they don't, to um, call upon the uh, masters, teachers, and protectors, both human and non-human, of the I Ching. Because there is not a system of time magic that I use that is as well, it's funny, like as well protected, but also like if you are polite, that is the one, it's like a members club, just like be a little bit polite and it will change your life. That's, you don't need yes. to be Chinese, right? but like it, don't fuck around or you will find out. Like this is, it is more protected and will fuck with you than astrology, which is literally like constellations of Babylonian gods, the Jing has like uh more like you and you want to acknowledge the masters guardians and what did i say teachers uh of both human and non-human right because respect respect yeah, yeah, yeah. yes and that's it it feels like 
when you show up to a members club and you don't have a jacket on and they're like, well, here, have the jacket. And now you like, they have a, a loan jacket and you can go in. It's that same kind of like, we ask one really basic, simple thing, which is just this little bit of respect. And then bam, it's, and then, then you get the teachers, then you get the whole, that's right. Well, you're here to talk to us. That's literally what we, 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 we we dropped our bodies and have spent the last few millennia it's what they want yes. on the other side of this process to you. And this is, we love it. And it's, it's really powerful. I think people should, maybe hopefully that's enough of an invitation. Put your jacket on and, um, and some 3000 year old dead Chinese people and a dragon. will talk to you. <laughs> it's the August ones. The August ones is who they are that, the word August, I got really nerdy into because my last name is Dao, which is French for August. And that word you'll see in all kinds of cultures, but it's it's the A-U, the A-U, which is that same word for gold or aura, the light beings, right, is who really the August ones are. When you read about the history of the I Ching, you're going to be directed to the August ones, one of which was Futsa who is credited with creating the I Ching, right? From the seeing the turtle shell. It's, he was a light being essentially that was like a serpent, right? A, basically like a wisdom serpent is uh, who you're talking to. So having that respect and also gratitude. And what about like some I Ching loves when you give it acknowledgement because it loves so much how perfect and clever it is. And I always tell people, like, I, I call it Mr. I Ching because uh, it's like mystery, but Mr. Yeah, I Ching, yeah. uh, because it's like a friend that you can consult and you can have like a relationship with it. So you can have gratitude and respect for it. And like you mentioned, that gives just a better experience and feedback when you do. It comes back to the do. being a community of beings. That's the consent mm -hmm. like, relating thing again. It's just like, just mm. don't be a dick. Yeah. And it will and it will open up, you know. <laughs> yes. It seems yeah. simple, yes. Yeah, it does, it does. So one of the things when Alberto teaches the incorporation of the Yijing into the east direction towards the end of the training, he says it is a oracle of um the plant kingdom. And huh. it, and like on the one hand you think yarrow sticks. But actually, it's because um, of the dragon part. It's the, because of the serpent. So in, in that system, Sachimama is a giant serpent. She's also the spirit of the Amazon and the spirit of plants and, and so on in general. Mm. So he does this thing. This is the real 90s stuff, which I find frustrating, um, is he has already digested the, um, the thinking and the details for you. And then he'll give you statements like that. And mm. I have to undigest them. I have to like reverse baby bird it and go, okay, that's where that, that's where that's going. But he yes. says it that way in a way that I think um, you'd appreciate because what I really enjoyed in your Yijing book is um, a very competent and robust understanding of the archetypal hyperdimensional universality of this dragon serpent being. Uh, yes. So, so tell us about like the Jing and, and serpent dragon stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. The the tagline on my book is the secret language of serpents, uh, very specifically, because if you I mean, look, if you look into the history in China, the descriptions of where the I Ching comes from and where wisdom comes from, you always end up at snake people, uh, no matter where you go, if it's South America, if it's Africa, you know, China, Aboriginal you, Australia, Rainbow Serpent. Aboriginal mm -hmm. Australia, the Norse lands where there's no snakes at all in nature. Somehow they still have uh, serpents in their thing and they don't even have freaking snakes. So it's such a universal archetype of the wisdom serpent, the oaf, the O-P-H, right? That oaf or obeya, right? Is that wisdom serpent. It's. Kelvin talks about it and the indigenous do in a way where it's like a frequency, right? So it's that wavelength uh, that you can get on. People think of it like, like a snake, like you would see in real life, which is true because all of the animals form their shapes and their, and us too are all in the shapes of the frequencies yeah. of these higher levels, right? So when you can see on higher dimensions, it's funny because everything is just like a copy or a mimic of those geometries, right? As they trickle down. So a snake 
is that wave form, which is that at that primordial base that everything is traveling in, the way energy travels is the serpent form. So everything in you is going to relate to that serpent and it is that primordial wisdom form because it is in everything. There's nothing that it's not in, right? Yeah. And that um when you're coming up on ayahuasca, why she presents to us as a serpent is you start to you experience that dimensional move as snake like for that reason. Like it, mm -hmm. it, we in in these bodies in these with, with this collection of sensory capacities, physical and non physical that we currently have, the best and it's what she's for, like the best metaphor for understanding that this is a topological unfolding is through that um, frequency stuff. So I've got the, yes. the Jing is going to run alongside the, the time magic course because one, it, I'm going to give you a Terrence McKenna quote, which I love in a minute um, about process so that people can understand that there's a, you will up level in any of your time magics, any kind of astrology with enough uh, I Ching time under the belt because you yes. learn different things about time. But also, and this is why I'm talking to you about it, this is a uh, serpent. So the serpent hyperdimensionally is the being that contains the wisdom that the universe is frequency based, right? Like that, that's why it's universal. <laughs> yes. Because that's, that's what it is. And the, the it is what, that's what it literally is. Yeah. Yes. And hence rainbow serpent is like my favorite expression of that. But like the best, uh, the, the, the ultimate like uh, instant message app to, to get a hold of that uh, particular reality um, I think uh, is the Ching, but I really love that, you know, like the competent and um, I want to say bold or brave. It's not quite right, but it, it's confident. Like the confident, like, listen, you're dealing with a uh, hyperdimensional snake that is uh, at one hand, a, uh, a luminous messenger. And on the other hand, everything. <laughs> yes. It's both. You, Simon, yes, exactly. It's a, it's like how light is a wave and yeah. it has those forms very much like light. So it's really describing in the mythologies, the physical laws of the universe by embodying it in that lesson. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And so um, there's a couple of points in it. So I had Reverend down in email and a couple of times, he's a good friend on the show, but when last time he was on talking about like Hebrew and um, the, the whole, like, mm. uh, the, like the aliens in the Bible stuff that happened last year, like the Hebrew word Nakash, for um serpent. yes that's right. right that's in the book as well mm. it's the yeah that kind of it's the animal form that we come into right that that serpent energy is the same in the hebrew stories right and in hermetic as well right hermes gets his wisdom by talking to poimanders a giant dragon right if we look at uh, even the Hebrew letters are from these fire things that they see in the sky from the serpent that always gives the wisdom. Like Moses with, uh, you know, the the rod and the serpent, it's always the same way that it's conveyed. The seraphim are the giant fiery serpents, you know, it's it's always the same story, that same relating. And yes. is the Nakash word also it means serpent and to divine. So when you see the word yes. or the, the thing show up, which like ayahuasca is a teacher, right? And a, an intermediate. Like she can do her own healing, but when you diet with ayahuasca, it's typically with another plant as yes. well, Kima Saber or whatever, because she's opening the door. It's the it's that yeah. Um and you're I, I you're having really an argument, it. right? You have to like I, I like to call it arguments, but maybe you'll relate to this is that, and the way Kelvin says is that you have to kind of like become yourself in front of them and then have that dialogue, that relationship, like you were oh, talking like about, right? Yourself. So yeah. you, you become yourself because you can feel them as this presence. And then they're like, who's this, who dis, yes, right? Yeah, who yeah, am yeah. I talking to? Uh, who are you? And when you come into a dialogue with like Aya or some of these, you know, sentient beings, you're like, oh, like th this incredible thing, right? It makes you really connect into like, who am I talking to this person? So I do feel like it's very, uh, like you were talking about, conducive to coming into that individuation by engaging with these discussions with the teachers. I 
this is a, a very flow model understanding of the cosmos, which suits the I Ching, but I think you only exist in relation. So to become something different, you come into relation with, dare I say, better beings, right? Like, so that's that when you start, you have to be like, mm. it has to be exactly who you are in that moment in front of them because you co-create each other in that relating and that, that is that right relating. It's yeah. Madness, but like good madness. It's like, it's yes, a literally a you trip. have to come into that totality or it's a, it's a way to achieve wholeness, right. Uh, by having experiences and being seen and uh, seeing the other, which then becomes part of yourself, right? You can always tell, I don't know if this happens to you, but you can always tell when someone's done DMT because it's like a, <laughs> or like you can tell if they have that uh, signature, almost like you'll be like, oh, you're friends with this person, I can tell because it's just this, uh, yeah, exactly. they've reached that frequency or vibration and have that experience and then it becomes integrated into who they are. Absolutely. So I wish I could do the voice because I would like, maybe if there's vocal coaches out there who can teach me how to do a good Terrence McKenna impersonation, <laughs> because I can't, but um, I want you all to hear it because this isn't from his book. This is from an old VHS interview for the publication of uh, an Ijing book or game in like the nineties, but I'm just going to read you this quote. Uh, in the same way that our culture since classical Greece has been interested in matter, the people who put together the I Ching were interested in time. Mm. And I think they got quite far in their exposition of it. They were interested in why things happen as they happen. This is a different question than we ask in the West. In the West, we have asked the question, what are things made of? In the West, we really have gotten no further than process has a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's essentially a three-element theory of process. The Chinese have a 64-element theory of process that allows them to perform a complex algebra of calculation as to what forces are impinging upon any event. And then they have this method of sortilege, this of divination, which allows them to extract out of each moment a hexagram appropriate to that moment and then to refer to a body of interpretation that illuminates that. And it's just very Terence. It's so good. And I love how he's talking about the different bits, right? That 64-bit data frame. It's funny, too, the, the beginning, middle, and end thing that he said is a way of presenting a uh, kind of totality or wholeness and it has to do with dimensionality so it's yeah. i just wanted to remark on that because uh beginning middle and end are like plots on a graph right so a lot of times i'll think and maybe when you start to experience time in larger ways for all the time magicians uh, especially through I Ching, it's just going to blow your mind. But if you want to start like a little smaller uh, to get like a initiatory uh, event is you, you can plot these charts and graphs, right? So, and then you start using the geometries dimensionally. So trying to deal with the time as a dimension is where we use the triangulation of points. And that's right. where it comes into time space, right? So that we see how the dimension of time also gets put into these locations and spaces, which is where you can then make that understanding of astrology so much deeper. But it's that fourth dimension, right? This is what is really, a lot of people don't talk about the fourth dimension. Everybody's so hot on 5D, right? You'll look it up online and everyone's talking about 5D. It's like the hot poop. But a lot of that I feel like is from uh, Ken Carey's book, The Starseed Transmissions. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? The channel. Well, uh, also just YouTube nonsense, but anyway. <laughs> right. But I I got really into 4D, which is the time space Tesseract stuff, right? Yeah, so you're going to have to do yeah. Tesseract stuff, which is uh, I wrote my novel 4D trying to approach that element of how these weird plots and points like beginning middles and endings are what is like kind of warping and weaving time and location uh together I Ching, of course jumps all the way past that like a you know like it's all pfft, child's play or whatever but if you're trying to kind of make maps or uh, understanding of time periods and stuff, if you link it in with that fourth dimensional aspect of that tesseract, 
it really helps your brain see time in reality in that dimensional uh way yeah i like that i like that yeah, yeah. what what was alive to me in what terence said was so in uh, in starships i use the work of dr davidovitz when it comes to some of the um blocks of the great pyramid were poured in place during they're essentially an ancient concrete process and mm -hmm. he makes the point that Egypt was the apogee of a 10,000 year experiment in stone. Uh, and then after that, we are two and a half thousand years, let's say 4,000 years, through an experiment in metal, in chemicals. Right? Yes. So it, we, the, the wet setting in place bricks that are part of the, um, the Giza Plateau are the result of 10,000 years of research of the capacities of stone. And uh, and I like w when Taryn said, like, the West went and looked at matter and the Chinese went and looked at time. Mm. I see those two things like, well, what would Oh, that that's very good, yeah. yeah. So, like, the, we got, quote, unquote, we, like, classical Greece, but, like, metallurgy and so on. Not that the Chinese were, I mean, they invented gunpowder. They were no slouch when it came to chemistry. <laughs> but, um, I like, we understand what, Terence means there, right? So you've got um, atomic theory with classical Greece, you've got Aristotle, you've got all of this. Like we went down like the stuffness of reality and mm. then went down the flowness of time. Mm -hmm. And we both put millennia into it. And I, what I like about Terence is like, this is why you should listen to the I Ching or play with it because we, they're, they're, they're thousands of years ahead of us when it comes to a theory of process and change, because that's what they focused on when we went and focused on bits. And the bits. Yeah. I think that's yeah. really, I, I find that really insightful. Like I sit with that and go, all right, that if, I, if we're going to convince people to dick about with the I Ching, maybe it's in, in that direction. Well, and it's so interesting, like, especially with the stone stuff you talked about, because that the material and matter contains the time secrets, yeah. right? Like time is like, it, there's this enmeshment of time and matter that is where I get really interested in with the dimensional stuff. Cause then when you can kind of go transparent, when you go into shaman realms, everything becomes like the matter gets weird. Right. And kind of like uh see-through or fake, it seems almost, it's, I don't know. I like the, that you said that, Cause my, uh, my hot take about how I blend what Dr. Davidovitz said about stone and what Terence, or I say just said, what he said 30 years ago while he was alive, um, is I feel like the bifurcation point where we went off in the direction of matter happened at the apogee of, let's say, the stone project, but the stone project was universal. So mm -hmm. like that's yeah. like by definition, it's Paleolithic. But if you go back 30,000 years to when we start doing things with stone, stone circles, all of this stuff, they're, they're, it's time magic, right? Yeah. So the experiment in stone is enough, uh, is, is far enough back to inform both the uh, culture that ultimately gave us the I Ching and, uh, and Egypt. And this earlier on when I said, I think the I Ching is Paleolithic, like I literally think. It is no, a, it, it is. Yeah, I, like we have the archaeological evidence for like three thousand years ago, but it was old three thousand years ago. I think it's. I think it's the telephone line to this time that I'm talking about. Well, what they they found it on uh, the oracle bones, right? So they would burn the turtle shells, like you mentioned, uh, which was kind of sad because that species of turtle became extinct that they used to use. Uh, but they would burn them and then they would mark some of the earliest languages. This was like 6,000 BC. Think about like uh, Sumerian and some of these other languages. That's like 3,000 BC. But at 6,000 BC, they were finding the oracle script archaeologically yeah. on these bones that were obviously used for I Ching because they saw that it was the I Ching scripts of the characters and the stories, right, that they were telling. So literally on the bones uh which is like our version of stone anyway it's as stone as we get is our bones oh. i guess but yeah and the 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 interesting thing about the stone too is similarly it's like containing these immortal things because that stone is that geologic way of knowing time rather than you know say an agriculture cult or something like this right it's Stones using that because yeah. they have more experience of being in time that's the shamanic that's right. understanding of it like that's right that's why the my uh, mesa behind me is filled with stones and crystals because one of them is is a hundred million years old immortals we're looking at immortals exactly. yeah so what is, like what i like about your book because uh, it's sort of how i do history as well is 
this is a uh, this is a serpent, and it is a, a a gift from a serpent. The earliest rituals we have on this planet at a hundred thousand years old are to a cosmic serpent. Yes. So how old is the I Ching? When you understand that there is some kind of reality behind capital T, capital S, the serpent, how old is the I Ching? Immortal. Yeah, yes, exactly. eternal. That's the correct. Answer. It's eternal, right? So it really helps you to engage with eternity. You know, I think so much of our malaise as human beings uh, comes from such a small or shortened perceptual ability. But when you engage in time magic or something that involves you in time magic, what you're really doing is connecting to eternity and what that does or what I hope it does and what I'll just put into everybody's ears right now is that it causes a kind of memory, that serpent memory mm -hmm. to start to awaken in you where you feel your eternal self in there somewhere start to wriggle around. So it, when, like you said, we become uh, through relation. And so when we come into a relation with these time magic entities like the serpents, we start to remember our own immortality and eternity. Yeah, so yeah. it the, really, this, yeah. Course, Cause I had Gregory Shaw cause the best book I've read that came out this year, Hellenic, Hellenic Tantra, um, and professor Gregory Shaw in the show. And he points out that Yamblichus yeah. Um, said that you had to do divination because it purified the soul. And so that's a Greek way of saying mm. what you just did then to experience time magic builds at the level of your, let's say, field, luminous body, whatever you want, true self, uh, an understanding of, of your true dimensions in place and in time. Yes. I don't think you'll get to them. I mean, some people will have confrontations with our mortality, right, through grief or things like this, but this is not the same experience. This is something, and I think it's important. I wish everyone would have this experience because it actually uh, helps so much with death and grief as well. Once you have these experiences with time magic and with divination systems and you can feel eternity, it really makes death and dying a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> and easier, you know? All right. Well, I mean, that's a pretty good place to, to start to land this plane, I think. What are the, <laughs> what, what other possible uh, invitation to exploring time magic could, uh, could you want? So, Maja Daru. So, see, I knew it was Daru, and I listened to a couple of podcasts to get it right on YouTube before this, and they obviously mispronounced your name. And I'm like, oh, so I would have thought it was Daru. But so I mispronounced your name to start with, and I won't do it again <laughs> next time. Oh, you're on. The French are so sneaky; they put in letters that they leave out. Well, because yes. French is like the only other because uh, I'm trying to learn Spanish terribly. But like French, I did French for five years at high school, so I look at it and go, "That's though I know what that is." But then I would hear people say "those," and I'm like, "Okay, so is this one of those North American um, ruinations of the, <laughs> the the French language?" Everyone in French is like. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and so I wonder if it's like oh, oh, when people like so uh, Ursula Le Guin, like she would answer to Ursula Le Guin, right? And it's like, is this? I assumed it was like that. It's like, oh, it's like Ursula. So it's so yeah. she's mispronouncing her last name. You weren't. I was mispronouncing your last name, and I shan't do no. it again. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Well, Marja, what have you got going on for people who want to know more and uh, and where they can find you and all that kind of stuff? Lay it on. Oh, sure. Uh... I just had an astrology shadow book come out um, that I basically figured out that if you take a birth chart and you flip it and create a mirror image of your birth chart using all the oppositional stuff, you can see your shadow or like uh, you can make kind of like a an anti you uh, or you're not you. And then. So I I feel like that's been going really well because it's expanding people by being able to see their shadow behaviors by engaging with that reversal or like inversion. Uh, so that's been really fun. And then I'm working on a shadow deck as well. That'll right probably cool. be out next year. And then I have, I know you had Richard Metzger on. I'm going to be in his magic show when that comes out. And that's going to be a lot of fun for everybody. Almost Every occultist you can think of, uh, Richard was able to interview in his amazing, amazing way. So I'm really excited for the magic show to come out. That'll be great. Nice one. All right. Well, this was a lovely chat. I knew it was going to be. It was a long time coming. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. 
Thanks so much, Gordon. Delightful speaking with you. 